Hello everyone. Welcome to MBBS classes. In this video, we will discuss about the anatomy of external auditory meatus. External ear is composed of two components. As you can see here in this diagram, this is pinna or the auricle. The auricle or the pinna is attached to the side of the lateral part of the head by the muscles and ligament. And the second component of external ear is external auditory meatus. The external auditory meatus, it is in continuation with the pinna which starts at the concha and it is up to the tympanic membrane. Now let's move on to the external auditory meatus or sometimes we call it external auditory canal. This external auditory canal it starts from the concha. This is the concha. This is the starting point. It is an S-shaped type of tube and it ends at the tympanic membrane. This is the tympanic membrane. So, one end is open and the other end is closed. The closed end is the medial end which is formed by the tympanic membrane. In adult person, the length of the external auditory meatus is approximately 24 mm. It has two components. The outer one third is cartilaginous. These are the cartilage. As you can see, these are the cartilage. This cartilaginous, it, is, it, it constitutes one third of the length of the meatus. That is around 8 mm. The inner two-third is formed by the bony meatus, which is a part of the temporal bone. So, the outer one-third is cartilaginous and the inner two-third is bony. The length, the total length is 24 mm. The outer cartilaginous length is 8 mm and the inner bony length is 16 mm. But one thing I want to highlight is that because this tympanic membrane is not placed vertically, it is in little bit oblique position. Because of its oblique placement of the tympanic membrane, the interior wall and the floor of the external auditory canal is longer. Moreover, the, if you look into the diameter of the external auditory canal, it is not uh, equal throughout its way. There are a few constrictions in the external auditory canal. The first constriction is at the junction of the cartilage and the bony junction. And the second junction is the isthmus. It is 5 mm away from the recess. This is the area of the recess where the bony canal is dipping down. So the second constriction is here. Since it is an S-shaped tube, so the direction is little bit different. The outer cartilaginous part of the meatus, its direction is inwards, upwards and backwards. Whereas the inner part, it directs inward, downwards and forwards. I repeat, the outer part is directed inwards, upwards and backwards. And the bony part, which is the inner part, is directed inwards, downwards and forwards. Why it is important? Because since because of its direction, while clinical examination, to examine the ear, we have to pull this pinna, we have to hold this pinna and pull it up outward, backward and upward. So that this canal is straightened and we can examine the tympanic membrane. However, the mode of examination is not same in case of infants. What happens in infants? What is the difference? The difference is that in infants, the bony canal, this bone can, you can see here, this is the bone which is forming the bony meatus. It is not developed in infants. First thing. Second thing is that the tympanic membrane, it is obliquely placed. It is in diagram of the adult 
temporal bone or the adult ear. But in infant, what happens? This tympanic membrane is placed horizontally. It is not as vertical. So, due to these effects, due to the horizontal placement of the tympanic membrane, due to the non-development of the bony canal, this auditory canal is not patent or you can say it is in collapse state. So, to examine the ear in case of infants, we have to pull this pinna rather lobule. We hold, we catch into the lobule and we pull it outward and backwards so that this meatus is opened up and we can examine the tympanic membrane. So, what are the parts of the external auditory meatus? So, the outer part is the cartilaginous part which is formed by the cartilage and it is in continuous with the cartilage of the auricle. The second part is the bony part which is formed by the two bones. These two bones, they are the part of the temporal bone. The first bone is the tympanic part of the temporal bone. So let's see where is the tympanic part of the temporal bone. This is the tympanic ring or this is the bony part. This is the tympanic ring. It forms the part of the external auditory meatus, the bony part, the bony meatus. Rather, it is the bony meatus. The second bone which contributes to the squamous, uh, to the uh, meatus is the squamous part of the temporal bone. As you can see here, this is the squamous part of the temporal bone. So, this tympanic part of the temporal bone, it forms the anterior wall, floor, part of the roof and part of the posterior wall. So, it forms the anterior wall, floor, part of the posterior wall and part of the roof. The squamous part of the, of the temporal bone, it forms the rest of the roof and the posterior wall. So, the bony meatus is formed by two bones. The first is the tympanic part of the temporal bone and second is the squamous part of the temporal bone. I would like to highlight here two important sutures which are important clinically. The first is the tympano squamous suture. Since this is the tympanic bone, this is the squamous part. So, this is the tympano squamous suture. This tympano squamous suture, it lies within the canal. This tympano mastoid suture, tympano mastoid suture is at the junction of this tympanic ring and the mastoid bone. It is formed by the posterior edge of the tympanic ring. It curves from the posterior external auditory canal inferiorly to within the few millimeter of the stylomastoid foramen. Here lies the stylomastoid foramen through which the facial nerve exits. So these are, it helps in a, or it, uh, it is rather one of the landmark for the facial nerve identification. So, let us discuss in details about the external meatus. What is, there are two meatus, cartilaginous and the bony. So, let's see what is special about the cartilaginous part. The cartilaginous part, it forms the outer one-third of the meatus. That is approximately 8 millimeter. As you can see here, this is the cartilaginous part. These are the cartilage. In this part of, of this meatus, in the outer meatus or in the cartilaginous part, we get certain glands which are not present in the bony part. So, remember the glands are present in the outer part whereas they are absent in the bony part. So, the glands which are seen in this part, they are the sebaceous glands and the 
seruminous glands. Sebaceous glands, they produce sebum and the seruminous glands, they produce wax. Moreover, we get hair follicles in the outer cartilaginous part. These, hair, these hairs are the tiny, short, vellus hairs. However, in case of adult males, sometimes we get terminal hairs in the tragus area, which is secondary characteristic of sexual development. What is here? You can see fissure of centurone. What is fissure of centurone? You can see here the gaps between the cartilage. So the fissure of centurone is seen in the cartilaginous part of the external meatus. These are naturally occurring defect in the floor of the cartilaginous part of the meatus. This is the fissure of centurone. These are the cartilage and this is the defect. Why it is important, we'll discuss later on. In the bony meatus, it forms the inner two-third, that means 16 millimeter of the meatus. The skin here is thin. It lacks the subcutaneous layer. As we have discussed, the glands, that is the pilosebaceous glands and the ceruminous glands, which are which is present in the outer part, it is absent in the inner part or the bony part. Here, sometimes we may get the foramen of hushke. Foramen of hushke, these are the opening in the anterior bony canal. These are the openings in the anterior bony canal due to the incomplete ossification, which sometimes acts as a potential pathway for the spread of disease beyond the canal wall. So, this is the diagram showing the characteristics of the skin of the external auditory meatus. You can see this is the epidermis. These are the hair follicles. This is the hair and we can see here there are two type of glands. So what's that? This is the pilosebaceous glands and the second is the ceruminous glands. So we get ceruminous glands and the pilosebaceous glands in the deeper part of the dermis and they, they open into the hair follicle. So, we remember the glands and hairs, they are present only in the cartilaginous part of the meatus. Blood supply. The blood supply and the lymphatic drainage, if you notice, they share a common thing with the auricle. That means the auricle and the external meatus. That means whole of the external ear, the blood supply is same. We have seen that anteriorly, the external meatus, it is supplied by superficial temporal artery. The posterior part is supplied by posterior auricular artery. The same blood supply is, for, is also for the auricle. Lymphatic drainage is also similar anteriorly the external meatus it drains into the preauricular nodes inferiorly it drains into the superficial cervical nodes and posteriorly it drains into the retroauricular nodes now let's come to the relations of the external auditory meatus This external ear, it has two components, cartilaginous part and the bony part, you can see here. But it is related to the surrounding structures. Posteriorly, we have this mastoid process. You can see this is the mastoid bone. It is a cut section. It, uh, it is in coronal section of the ear. Here is the parotid gland. 
superiorly you can see this is the middle cranial fossa just in front of the ear we have one fossa that is the glenoid fossa of the temporomandibular joint so if we look into the relations of the external auditory meatus anteriorly the ear uh, the external auditory meatus is related to the glenoid fossa glenoid fossa is not shown here glenoid fossa of the temporomandibular joint and the inner part of the head of the mandible posteriorly it is related to the mastoid hair cells superiorly it is related to the middle cranial fossa and inferiorly to the parotid gland so with this diagram you can see here it is a soft tissue picture with the overlapping picture of the temporal bone this we have i have given you so that for better understanding of the relations of the external auditory canal so if you see first if, let's see the soft tissue anatomy let us trace this is the pinna that is the helix this is the lobule okay this is the tragus so this is our auricle on soft tissue just in front of the auricle here we have one fossa as you can see here in this curved like group this is the area of the glenoid fossa where the temporomandibular joint is situated this is the area for the parotid little bit anterior inferior to the auricle this here is the area of the parotid so if you see here this is the opening of the meatus in the soft tissue area and if you see in the temporal bone this is the area of the bony meatus let's look into the relations anteriorly it is related to the glenoid fossa of the temporomandibular joint the inner two third and anteriorly it is related here we have mandible so it is related to the inner two third of the mandible here lies the superficial temporal vessels so anteriorly the external meatus is related to the superficial temporal vessels also the upper part of the parotid gland and the parotid nodes so what are the structures which are present anteriorly in relation to the meatus it is the glenoid fossa of the temporomandibular joint the inner two third of the head of the mandible superficial temporal vessels the upper part of the parotid and the preauricular nodes posteriorly this meatus is related to the mastoid bone inferiorly it is related to the parotid gland and superiorly it is related to the middle cranial fossa so let's see the little bit applied anatomy of the external auditory meatus first is the curvature so what is the significance of curvature since this external auditory meatus is not a straight meatus it is s shaped we have already discussed it is an s shaped with the direction the the out the cartilaginous part which is pointed upward inward and backward and the bony part which is directed inward forward and inferiorly so because of this s shaped this tympanic membrane is little bit in a protected state so any trauma or any sort of injury from it is in a protected state because of the curvature of the meatus next is the pharyngolysis as we get hair follicles only in the outer part that is the cartilaginous part we will if any patient is coming to you with the pharyngolysis it will be 
affecting only the outer one third of the meatus. We have already discussed there are two constrictions in the meatus. The first is the bony cartilaginous junction, and second is the isthmus, which is situated five millimeter from the recess or the tympanic membrane. So, because these two areas are the narrowest point of the meatus, so any wax foreign body or debris if it is collected beyond the beyond the constriction so we have to look into the account and we have to be careful while trying to attempt to clean or remove the foreign body or any other material now let's see the fissures and foramens in the outer part the fissure of santeroni is present and in the bony part, we have discussed one foramen of Hushke. So, what happens if there is any pathology or infection or malignancy of the outer part? This fissure of Santeroni is a potential pathway for the spread of infection from the ear to the superficial part of the parotid gland, which is related, and to the mastoid ear cells. So, I repeat, this fissure of Santeroni is a potential pathway for the spread of infection and malignancy beyond the external ear. Similarly, this foramen of Hushke, which is situated in the interior bony wall, it also is a potential pathway for the spread of disease beyond the canal to the deeper part of the parotid gland and beyond. Thank you. This is all for this uh, video.